No, you, no worries. All right. Of course, it's uh, jumping here a little bit. Hi, everybody. Welcome to B-Sides. This is great. Um, we're just going to go through a couple housekeeping things. We're going to get Mr. Drake going here. Um, and I'm going to do a quick introduction, and then he will he'll take off. Um, so housekeeping wise, uh, no smoke, you know, no smoking, no drinking. Um, just FYI, it's a uh, hospital. So if you do have a medical problem, you are close to being saved. Uh, it's right downstairs. Uh, I think we're actually right above the ER, in fact. So, so there you go. We're all we're all good. Um, if you have a flash, just kind of do that in private. Parking wise, if you parked in the near lots, you will be towed. Just FYI. They always come up here and they're like, hey, listen, we had to move some cars. There was patients that couldn't get to the, to the care. Please respect that. Um, you know, the biggest thing with, uh, with this event, um, and we'll talk about that here in a second is we just got to be gentle on the buildings. We, we caught a little criticism last year of being a little too rough. So, um, but parking wise, please make sure that you parked in the remote parking. Uh, the shuttle buses should have been moving and, and, uh, we're off to a little bit of a late start, but we're, we got some, some flux and some, uh, some leeway we can do to make up that time. Um, restrooms, restrooms are on either side. Okay. Uh, one quick thing about the restrooms, what we'd like to do for the flow this year, because we can't put the signs up that say like enter on this side and exit on this side because it damaged the walls and that costs like $2,000 to fix spackling. Um, please make sure that you go in this circular pattern where you exit this way. So you'll always exit on this side toward the screen and you'll go all the way around and come back to enter. So if you're going to stay in the same room, you're fine because eventually we're going to put the dividers up. But uh, if you're going to leave the room and go to a different room, just exit on towards the screens and just go all the way around and come into the next room. Okay. Um, Staff at Ohio Health, just go ahead and if you could, just observe them, you know, like in the sense of uh, just leaving them alone, be polite. Um, we didn't have any problems last year, but uh, as uh, the one statement said right down here, we did have the fire marshal show up mysteriously, so we don't know if we, like, upset someone, just FYI. So, um, like I said about the facilities, please be kind. In the sense of moving the furniture, we can move chairs in here. We can move tables. It's the furniture out there. They didn't really appreciate us changing, and we didn't grab a picture of it before we moved it last year. Um, so if you could, just remember that. Last year, we had chairs practically all the way down the elevator. So um, just be kind. That's all. Um, and then there are fire exits. You've got the main entrance where you came down here as well as down at the very end. You have fire exits down here. Okay. Um, real quickly, our sponsors, uh, we want to thank Ohio Health for the venue. Um, without them, this event really wouldn't even happen because, uh, because they give us access to this venue and they, they do it for free. So, you know, without that, thank you. We appreciate it. Um, Tech Systems, we'd like to thank them for breakfast. Uh, Securicon, um, thanking them for lunch. Cisco, if you look down at your badges, they came up with these really cool badges. Um, if anybody, I also put the uh, the company that made the badges in here. If you want to know who who did those, um, Stealth Care for the shirts, uh, CBI for your first uh, Columbus B sides after party. So hopefully you guys will be able to make it, or and ladies, you'll also be able to like, make it tonight. Um, it's a video game place. It's a, it's called a uh, 16-bit arcade, and uh, I think it's bar or something like that. Um, Trusted Sec is doing all the videography. Uh, Zero Fox took care of some travel miscellaneous as well as all of you. So that's how we got this thing put together in time. So, so again, thank you guys. Um, announcements, just real quickly here. Uh, here's the schedule. If you want to look at it online, you can look at it on your phone. It rem renders fairly well on mobile uh, phones. Uh, lunch day between 11.50 and 1. Uh, one o'clock is what we call the uh, the young guns uh, hour, where basically more new speakers are going to go ahead and talk. So speakers who hadn't talked before, they're going to go ahead and try to talk during that time. Your badges were made locally by a company called Griffin Hollow Studios. So if you like what you see, definitely reach out to them. Uh, the the gentleman who runs that place is very artistic. I was really impressed with what he did. Um, uh, I was really surprised at what uh, what we had for the after party. Bring your badge; you'll need it. That's how we're going to know that you are, you actually went to Columbus B-Sides. Otherwise, we could have people walking in off the street going, yeah, we're the B-Sides. The next thing you know, all that, uh, all that, uh, you know, money that CBI is putting forward to have, allow you to have a great time is going to go rather quickly or much more quickly. 
Uh, website, well, we're going to have an official website, but we missed it by about three weeks, uh, unfortunately. So uh, with that said, uh, um, look for it here in a couple weeks. One last thing, application security study group. If you're interested in doing this, uh, reach out to me. I think everyone's got my email at this point. Uh, reach out to me or even reach out to the, to the uh, B-Sides Columbus uh, email address. Um, make sure that you let me know. Uh, the big thing I would say with this is that it's not going to be a, a come and get free training. It's going to be you're going to pitch in and you're going to become a mini expert on a portion of application security to help others learn. So that's kind of how hacking works. All right. So we're going to go ahead and introduce uh, Mr. Drake here. We're going to also give him a little extra time. Uh, so we may uh, we may start the 10 o'clock round a little bit slower, but we should be able to catch up by lunchtime. Um, so I kind of made it in like a Mission Impossible dossier for, for Mr. Drake here. Just trying to make it a little entertaining. So hopefully I didn't make him too mad. Uh, previously worked for the NSA. Um, if you don't know what the NSA is, we need a long talk with you. Uh, as for, <laughs> no such agency. Um, first day as the executive director was on 9-11-2001, ironically. Uh, he was arrested for the espi or for espionage by the FBI, spent everything that he had to basically clear his name. Uh, still to this day, uh, kind of harassed by the dot .gov crowd for whistleblowing. Um, and ironically, and this is just something that, I, that I'd found out just doing more and more research on Mr. Drake, is that Edward Snowden actually said this is the reason why he went the way that he did was because he saw what happened to Thomas Drake. So with that said, Mr. Drake, you're up. Well, I'm really glad I'm here in uh, Columbus, Ohio. Um, it is a little cold, but the one thing I can say is you can't freeze freedom no matter how cold it gets. When I was invited uh, to come here uh, by Mike uh, some months ago, we made all the arrangements. When he mentioned B-sides, and I was familiar with you just from the internet and, and others who've attended some of your sessions, it threw me back to when I was a little kid with 45s and 78s because we were always curious what, was what, you, what would play on the other side when you flipped it over. What I'm going to be sharing with you is the other side. I call it the dark side of the American dream. What became an American nightmare for me. But I think it's important given what today is Martin Luther King Jr. There's a quote from him that's extremely relevant for me in terms of what I went through. Because see, I stand here in front of you as a free man, as a free human being. And I can't even begin to tell you what that means, how extraordinarily precious freedom and liberty is. When you're faced, as you will hear in terms of my story here soon, as I unfold it for you, and I'm going to be asking you to put yourself in my place, in my position, what it means when the government does everything it can to take those freedoms and liberties away. I can tell you without any equivocation, you can never take freedom and liberty for granted, ever. There's too many people, there's too many forces, there's too many others out there who enjoy taking it away from others. Martin Luther King said, Jr. said, quote, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. About things that matter. Back in our history, there's this thing called the Declaration of Independence. And after we beat the British in a very violent American Revolution, and after the utter failure of the Articles of Confederation, a grand experiment was launched in 1787. It took a couple of years to ratify it, called the Constitution. That was a grand experiment. It was no guarantee. Benjamin Franklin, at the end of that very uh, secret series of meetings that formed that Constitution, when he came out, he was reportedly asked by a woman reporter, you know, what did you guys do in there? Right? 
it? What did you create? Say a republic, if you can keep it. If you can keep it. And that's going to be kind of a theme. What is it we're either losing and what is it we need to keep? Because the story I'm about to tell you about myself raises the most fundamental questions about who we are as Americans, about who we are as citizens, and about freedom and liberty and those inalienable rights, those extraordinary inalienable rights. They're granted all human beings. I used to serve in the military, and I'll say a little bit about that as well in terms of the backdrop to what ultimately happened to me after 9-11. When you see the flag flying upside down, what does that mean? Distress, in trouble. I can make a very powerful case that the flag of the United States of America to which I saluted a number of times, four times in fact, taking the oath to support and defend the Constitution in my government career, is now flying upside down. If it's flying upside down, how do we write it right side up? Again, this is another theme. And some of the things I'm going to say, I, I don't mince words because of what I went through. You don't face the prospect when you're threatened with spending the rest of your life in prison by a government prosecutor. You don't face that prospect without focusing on what really matters. And remember, all I did was support and defend the Constitution. If that doesn't matter, nothing else that I will share with you today will make any difference at all. None because there's a whole lot at stake. There's an interesting series. In fact, it's, Amazon has put a tremendous amount of money into it. How many of you seen the first season of The Man in the High Castle? I saw it recently over, over Thanksgiving holiday with my son, who was a junior in college. And it's based on the dark dystopian novel written by Philip Dick, one of my favorite authors, is dark and dystopian as much of his writing is. But he posited an alternative history of what would have happened if the Allies in World War II had not prevailed against the Axis powers. And I have to say, having watched most of the first season, it sent chills through me. It really did. And part of the reason why, in terms of my own history, is that during the Cold War, I used to fly in RC-135s out of RAF Milden Hall, England, as a crypto-linguist. I specialize in German and Russian, electronics, radio communications. Guess what country was the focus of my listening? East Germany. I spent many years listening in on the communications of that country. You don't listen in on the communications of a police state without it affecting you. But I never could have imagined, and of course all this was running through my mind again, watching my son and his friend with a man in the high castle. By way of short history, to give you a little bit of context of why ultimately chose to do what I did and take the actions that I did after 9-11. I grew up in Texas and Vermont. Both states were republics before they became states. Very interesting history. Most of my youth was spent in Vermont, 14th state. It was independent for 14 years before it joined the new United States of America. And I grew up understanding what real democracy meant because every year we would have town meeting day in March. And it was usually right at the beginning or in the middle of mud season. And that was the one day where everybody got to say their piece. 
We held ourselves to account, reviewed the past year's activities. We looked at what we had promised ourselves, what worked, what didn't. The town conscience was a farmer down the street named Fred Cooper. Fred Cooper lived in a ramshackle farm, and people wondered how he ever survived with a couple of cows and, a bar and barns that were falling apart. Well, it turns out his brother was the one that had the money and kept him afloat. But Fred Cooper spent a lot of time driving around town, where I lived in Wells, Vermont, keeping track of things, talking to people. And every town meeting day, he would spend about a half hour, and everybody would just listen to him. And he spoke in an extraordinarily heavy Vermont drawl, and even for Vermonters, he was hard to understand. But he was the town conscience. And he held us to account. And he reminded us of the promises that we made to each other and commitments we had made as a town and as a community. I grew up in the 1970s during the Nixon administration. I remember watching the hearings with the House Impeachment Committee. In fact, a very young Hillary Rodham at the time was a junior lawyer on that committee. Interesting history as to why she was cast off that committee. Or she's running for president of the United States right now. It was during the 1970s, given the history of the United States, that what was burned into my civic consciousness was that no person was above the law not even the president. And a lot of things were revealed in the 1970s. It was a very interesting period in our history. Again, I never imagined, even with that history, and the warnings at Frank Church of the Church Committee, Senator Frank, late Senator Frank Church, when he warned the nation about what could happen if and he referred to the equivalent of a tyranny descending upon this nation. What would happen if? I never imagined, even then, what I'd be confronted by right after 9-11. In 1979, I joined the Air Force. I left the Air Force in 89. I went to the CIA. I then joined the Navy as a reserve intel officer down at the Pentagon. I'm sitting on the terrorism desk in the Alert Center. Anybody remember what happened in 1993 in New York City? When they, when they, and I say they in quotes, attempted to drop the World Trade Center towers the first time with truck bombs. If they had positioned those trucks a little bit differently, it might have been far worse. We sent out reports at that time. This is when I was first introduced in terms of intelligence to Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. We sent out reports, and I've said this publicly a number of times, and I'll say it in summary here, warning the National Command Authorities that they meant business and that they would come back. This is not a one-off. I remember the senior intelligence officer for the DOD on the military side, the J-2, who reported directly to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, coming down to the Alert Center, leaning over the cubicle, and saying, yeah, I'm seeing all reports. He says, who cares about some raghead spouting off in the desert? Who cares? All ignored. 1993. Fast forward to 9-11, my first day in the job. I had just joined NSA, a special outside hiring prog program. In some ways, I was an accident. They were actually advertising for outside people to join NSA, not people that had grown up there. They were looking for a number of people at the senior level, and I came in as a senior executive reporting to the number three person. 
at NSA in their Signals Intelligence Directorate. My first day on the job was 9-11. And I remember sitting in a briefing in the Legislative Affairs Office where the person I reported to was attempting to explain to a technical advisory group for the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence why NSA needed umpteen billions of dollars to modernize because they're having great difficulty figuring out what would we get for the money. A program, by the way, called Trailblazer. The executive assistant for the Signals Intelligence Director, early on in that briefing, opened up the back door to the conference room and said, oh, some kind of freak accident, a plane hit one of the World Trade Center towers. No one really thought about it. I remembered there was a bomber that hit the Empire State Building back in the 30s. Wasn't long after the same executive assistant opened the same door again and said the other tower had been hit. What do I remember? Everything's frozen in time for me because for me, there's before 9-11 and then there's after 9-11. It's literally my life is that split. I remember getting up saying America's under attack and the next four months are essentially a complete blur. And I didn't really even begin to feel normal again until about four months later when I was, because I was born in Louisiana, I was found myself in New Orleans celebrating Mardi Gras with family and friends. George Tenet, the CIA director in 1998, said the system was blinking red. I will tell you right now, there was no excuse for why 9-11 happened, but it was used it was used by the elite, it was used by Dick Cheney and Bush to do all manner, all manner of malfeasance against the Constitution in the deepest of secrecy. It's the excuse that Cheney was looking for to restore the imperial presidency. He had always said that Nixon got a raw deal. He was the one that, with Rumsfeld, to convince President Ford to pardon Nixon, which I believe was a fundamental historical mistake. Because he never actually held the President of the United States accountable for what were egregious breaches of the special oath that the President takes that's actually stated in the Constitution to preserve, protect, and defend. That's the fundamental oath that the President takes. And so, there I was, knowing that we had utterly failed the nation, and practically the entire workforce of NSA realized that, because under the preamble of the Constitution, one of the core requirements, one of the fundamental responsibilities of the federal government is to provide for the common defense, to keep people out of harm's way. That did not happen on 9-11. And we're paying an extraordinarily high price, both in terms of history and in terms of the tragic strategic consequences that resulted from the failure to keep people out of harm's way on 9-11. There's a lot more about 9-11 that could be said, but there I, there I was, deep in the darkest heart of NSA, and now I'm going to unfold in rapid sequence not only what, what I was confronted by, because everything that happened within the first few days, weeks, and months of 9-11 set the frame for everything else that happened afterwards. And although it took many years to unwind, I ultimately found myself facing a number of egregious felony charges levied at me 
by the Department of Justice simply because I had chosen to honor my oath to support and defend the Constitution. But it became a criminal act. And so what I'm about to share with you is really the counter narrative because there's been an extraordinarily powerful narrative, which I can really only call propaganda, that the government continues to wield and it has not changed in the intervening almost 15 years now. We're going on 15 years since that fateful day. Because I've always wondered, and it's the burden of history that I now carry, given what happened to me, and as well as others like me, who absolutely were not going to compromise remaining faithful to the Constitution and holding true faith and allegiance to the same. The question of what if, what if 9-11 was, had been prevented, what if 9-11 had not happened? Of course, there's a lot of players involved in 9-11. Just consider the missing 28 pages. A whole nother story. And so I was exposed in this period to extraordinarily dark knowledge about what the government was doing in the deepest of secrecy, using secrecy and classification to cover it up, and unleashing it absent any consent of the governed. And what I can only say in this extraordinarily strong language, but I've said this before and I'll say it again to you all here, it was a silent coup against the Constitution. And emergency powers were invoked and the United States has continued to operate under emergency powers, what some call legally exigent conditions ever since. And the full extent of that is still not been fully revealed. Still not. Government licensing unto itself the ability to bypass any and all laws, regulations, and statutes that existed for what I can only call is what has become the new state religion called national security. And we're supposed to bow down before it. We are not to question it. That is the authority, national security. Remember what Benjamin Franklin said about those who would seek a little temporary safety. And part of the problem here is that it became a zero-sum game, all or nothing. And I'm telling you here, given my knowledge, the knowledge that I'm con continued, I'm continued, I'm continued my burden, the burden that I continue to carry, is that none of this was necessary. And at the very best of America, the very best of our own innovation, inventiveness, necessity being the mother of invention, already had this solved, could have easily have rolled up the threat. But there were forces and powers that use it for other reasons. And allowed what happened to happen and use it as an excuse to essentially strip away the heart of the American experience. And we're now living with those consequences. And I am a living example of what happens when the government decides to come after you with everything they've got. But see, I am still, still to this day, in an extraordinarily fortunate position. That is a fortunate because I'm the only person to date in light of mass surveillance who ended up being charged as a criminal after being criminally investigated, secretly charged, publicly indicted, facing 35 years in prison, and then was convicted and sentenced. But I remained free. All the others, and Snowden had to escape the United States, all the others, all the others remained free, meaning those who authorized the programs, who implemented the programs, who managed the programs. We forget our own history again. Because there's a lot of myths about NSA, and there's a lot of that goes around to cover a lot of the misdeeds and the violations of law. We forget 
how far off the rails NSA went during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. We forget. If we forget our own history, guess what we're doomed to do? Repeat it. NSA was created in the deepest of secrecy. It was not legislated by Congress, not signed into law by the president. It was the stroke of a secret presidential pen under the Truman administration by President Truman in 1952, a secret military intelligence agency. Just keep that in mind because that, and it was in the deepest of the Cold War. We forget the context in which some of this has occurred and why the military industrial complex is fundamental to understanding the warning that even President Eisenhower issued in his farewell address in 1961 to the nation that has come back to haunt us. So what happened right after 9-11? What was I faced with? Pandora's box was opened up. I'm looking deep into the abyss, and the abyss is looking back at me. Because I'm now confronted by the distinct and tragic reality that my own government in the deepest of secrecy is sabotaging the Constitution. Sabotaging the Constitution for the sake of national security. And in the deepest of secrecy, first verbal authorizations in secret meetings and then an executive finding order in the first week in October of 2001 granting NSA license to turn the United States of America into the equivalent of a foreign nation for the purpose of dragnet electronic surveillance on an incredible scale. The full extent of which has still not been revealed and the full extent of which hasn't even been touched on even by the Snowden disclosures. It's ultimately the reason why the government came after me. But we'll get to there in a few minutes. So in those first few weeks and months, NSA, in partnership with a number of other government agencies, turned its extraordinary power and began to instrument the electronic infrastructure of the United States and also leveraging secret, in some cases super secret, arrangements and agreements that it had with telcos and other service providers. But in particular, certain large telecommunication concerns who are more than willing to partner with NSA. And it didn't matter what the law said. It didn't matter that there was a Fourth Amendment. It didn't matter that there was a Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that had been, that had been put into place in 1978 and up, updated five times since to keep up with the times and the technology. It didn't matter. When I confronted the lead attorney at NSA the first week in October, after I had gone to my immediate supervisor, the number three person, I said, what are we doing violating the Constitution? We're violating the Fourth Amendment. See, it had become, over the intervening 23 years, it was the prime director of NSA. You could not violate the Fourth Amendment of a U.S. person without a warrant. You still have to go to the secret court, although there were, there were conditions where you could do hot pursuit, wartime equivalent conditions, direct threat, you still have to go back to the court, completely bypassed. Chilling words were then shared with me. So you don't understand, Mr. Drake. And here's was my moment of truth, literally. Because now I could choose to ignore or I could choose to act. You say, you don't understand, Mr. Drake. The White House, this is nearly a direct quote, the White House has approved the program. It was referred to as the program. Known as Stellar Wind, but it was called the program. The White House approved the program. The NSA is the executive agent, and it's all legal. And as soon as he said it's all legal, I was thrown right back to the 1970s with President Nixon. Remember what the president said. The president says it's legal. Guess what? 
Really? Just because the president says so? I then said, you know, there is a constitutional means in this country by which you change law. Remember, it's 9-11. Almost 3,000 people are murdered. You would think that if the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act was insufficient for the day and the times and the needs, Congress would have bent over backwards to authorize practically anything. And then he said the following to me, if we do that, they will say no. And I knew in that moment that not only had the wheels come off the Constitution, but I was now facing the reality that we were in an entirely different vehicle. And I have to say it right now, an alien form of government. I didn't take an oath to defend that kind of government. As General Hayden, former director of NSA said, who's central to understanding my case, when confronted politely about what were the legal authorities prior to all the legislation, debate made legal what had been patently unconstitutional, and this was during a CPAC conference last year. Lou Dobbs was the moderator. He was facing off against Judge Napolitano. What was the authority? Raw executive authority. Raw executive authority. This is a rhetorical question for the audience, but what form of government is a, is, comes under the definition of raw executive authority? Well, I heard the F word, fascism. Ooh, extraordinarily chilling. You can imagine watching the man in the high castle. There I was, right? Remember, grand experiment, no guarantees. Yes, the Constitution is flawed, but hey, it's a constitutional republic. And here I am seeing it dismembered in secret. No debate, no discussion. We just set it aside. It's in the way of national security. It doesn't matter if we're violating it. At that point, I made a choice. I exercise my moral conscience, and I made a choice for as long as I could, I would defend the Constitution against my own government with everything I had. Now, does that matter? I've been told, it's just a piece of paper, Tom, it doesn't matter anymore. You don't understand. National security takes primacy. Don't you want to feel safe? Don't you want to be secure? I'll say more about that toward the end of my talk, because I'm going to posit something for you all, which may lead to a very interesting discussion. Because if, if this doesn't matter, then you're actually seeing the slow collapse of that special form of democracy it's called, it's called the Constitutional Republic. After all, it's just an experiment. So I became a whistleblower. And during the period of 2002, I was a material witness for two 9-11 congressional investigations. Of course, I've spent 13 years now trying to locate all of the thousands of pages of documentation that I gave about how far off the rails the government went on a number of fronts because every, people have tried to find the records can only find that I was interviewed. Nothing else appears to exist. I was told by a very close source to these investigations, particularly the joint inquiry, that what I shared with them was so secret that it couldn't even be in the secret report. So it's as if that history never existed. How convenient to just cut out history that's extraordinarily relevant to this period in our country. 
I became a material witness for a multi-year Department of Defense Office of Inspector General investiga investigation audit. I had multiple meetings and sessions at great risk with others in the government as well as others that I used to work with. I confronted General Alexander, who's making a whole lot of money now selling his security wares to Wall Street and other corporations for a nice, pretty song, part of the revolving door. Confronted him in November of 2005. And then I found myself shortly thereafter without a job. In December of 2005, there was this extraordinary article in the New York Times revealing for the first time the existence of the so-called warrantless wiretapping program. It caused a huge stir at NSA. Of course, I had known about this since right after 9-11. I was not a source for the New York Times, never spoke to those reporters. In fact, going to the press was fraught with enormous peril. It was what some of us refer to as a third rail, especially if you worked in national security. All kinds of articles came out, subsequent investigations. This is years before Snowden. And the Department of Justice ended up launching a massive criminal leak investigation to find the sources for that article. I knew that when that article was published, there would no doubt be an investigation. I knew when they launched the investigation that I would get caught up in it as well as others. Why? Because a number of people that knew about the program, the mass domestic surveillance program, at this point, it was an extraordinarily expansive program involving most all of the telcos, internet service providers, practically every phone number that existed in the country, email accounts, financial records, and inter internet usage, plus a few other things. Mass collection, a real dragnet. The mantra was, we just need the data. That's what I was told by that attorney back in early October 2001. You don't understand, we just need the data. The obsession, have you ever seen any of the hoarding shows NSA became obsessed with collecting data. Still is. As if growing the haystack makes it easier to find the needle. You know, I did grow up on a farm, and the higher you pile it, the harder it is to find anything in the haystack, let alone a needle. You would think you'd want smaller haystacks. And so, a massive leak investigation was launched, and I became a target of that government investigation. As I found out later, a source said Cheney had issued the edict, find and fry the perpetrators, find the leakers, I don't care who they are, burn them. It was clear they wanted to make an example of somebody or somebody's. And those of us who had gone, become material witnesses as part of official government investigations, our names were given to them as likely suspects as of sources for the New York Times. Now there's a lot more to the story. It's an extraordinary story. It's the deeper, the deeper threads of the story show how far the government's willing to go to silence and suppress anybody who dares question their authority, but particularly questions national security, but in particular is whistleblowing, revealing any information even within the system regarding the use of national security to cover up violations of law. Remember, none of this was necessary. None of it. The very best of American ingenuity was simply discarded. And so, over the course of several years, this investigation continued. At one point, 
as we understand it from other sources that were reported out in the, in the press, five full-time prosecutors and 25 full-time agents, FBI agents, including agents from their elite mole hunter unit. The mole hunter unit, they call themselves mole hunters, are the ones specially trained to go after real spies. They were using those resources to come after those who would dare expose government criminal conduct and activity. And so my colleagues in July were raided by the FBI, and four months later, I'm getting ready, I'd moved on to another job at the National Defense University, where I was teaching as a visiting professor of behavioral science at Fort McNair in D.C. I'm getting ready to go to work, and about a dozen FBI cars pull up out in front of my house, and a whole bunch of them are piling out. Other cars show up later, and people are coming and going, but there was about a dozen agents total who flooded my property and served me with a warrant went through my entire house over a nine-hour period. I just chose to cooperate. I was actually read my Miranda rights, interestingly enough. I chose to cooperate to continue to report government crimes, but they didn't want to hear about that. It was clear that I was now the target of this investigation, that at this point had now gone on for a couple of years. Five months into my cooperative period, I was in New York City trying to clear my head because I realized that I faced a very dark future. And I was told to report to a secret FBI facility. And when I got there, this is why I'm telling my story the way I'm telling it to you right now, to really give you a sense of what it's like to live in a future, an Orwellian, Huxleyan future that I don't want anybody to go through. It's not pretty. It is the B side of the American dream, the dark side of the American dream. The chief prosecutor said, how would you like to spend the rest of your life in prison, Mr. Drake? And in that moment, your entire life is flashing before your eyes. Unless, this is the hook, unless you cooperate with our investigation. And maybe you'll only get 20 or 30 years, maybe. You know, at least this side of 40. I said, I do not plea bargain with the truth. And so I cut off all communication, um, hired an attorney, went through all my liquid assets, was essentially bankrupt and broken. And then as this wound out, it goes into the Obama administration. Of course, the Bush administration never actually indicted me. It took the Obama administration to indict me. An interesting twist on all of this. Even President Bush in his memoirs said that, hey, you know, why criminalize what were policy differences? Of course, it was the government that was the criminal because they were violating the Constitution. Is if that matters to violate the Constitution. Got to remember our own American Revolution. Why do we even have an American Revolution? We forget, too easily forget. And so between 2008 and 2010, over a two-year period, multiple attempts through my attorney were made to get me to plea bargain out to many decades in prison. And I continued to refuse any and all agreements. And so I found myself on March 25th of 2010 in the same secret FBI facility in the same dark room with no windows. And this was really Kafkaesque. It still is another frozen moment with the chief prosecutor putting in front of me a bunch of felony counts that I was a really, really bad person. And I deserved many, many decades in prison for what I had done. And I was being charged in secret with espionage, a 1917 World War I era statute. 
designed to go after spies and saboteurs, not whistleblowers, and those who would dare speak truth to power about power violating the law. Didn't matter. So three weeks later, I was very publicly indicted, facing 35 years in prison on 10 felony counts. And now the real nightmare had begun, because in that moment, I had to now do everything I could to defend the very liberties and freedoms I had taken an oath four times to support and defend, because they wanted to take them away from me. And so the next 14 months, extraordinary, many, many filings, back and forth, government doing all kinds of tricks, um, playing, attempting to play the court for a fool, and their case began to collapse because the judge wouldn't play the game. It was kafka where they wanted a silent witness rule, they wanted to claim that things that were actually unclassified were classified, even if they weren't. Um, and all of this was based on evidence, evidence that they had framed me with, where they had pretextually done a force classification and made it look like it was actually classified when it was never classified to begin with. And ironically enough, it was based on evidence, unclassified evidence that I had actually given in whole or in part to official government investigators. So on my terms, I was able to work out in a, a plea agreement in which they dropped all the felony counts for a minor misdemeanor for having exceeded under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, ironically enough, because they had to find something in Title 18 in the Criminal Code, for exceeding authorized use of a computer. I hear some titters. <laughs> exceeding authorized use of a computer, yeah. During the pro forma sentencing, um, the judge, when the prosecution just would not relent, he took him to task, said that what they did was unconscionable, didn't pass a smell test, and they had put me and my family and others through hell for four years. And then we don't do this. That's why we have, we had American Revolution. Extraordinary. If you go back and look at the judge's statement, extraordinary statement. And so I was free. One year probation, 240 hours of community service, in which I interviewed veterans from World War II to the present day. So let me summarize, and then I, I want to posit a little exercise for you, because I've heard something for the last four and a half years that continues to really bother me. That even in spite of all this, in spite of what went, I went through and others, in spite of what this country faces, in spite of what has happened since 9-11, I will hear an excuse as to why it's all necessary and why it doesn't matter to me, me, others. When I was interviewing these veterans, but particularly World War II veterans, my father is a World War II veteran, all of them without exception, in their own poignant way, actually were questioning whether or not, remember, they were survivors. I have survivor's guilt. And all their buddies they left on the battlefields around the world. Was all that sacrifice worth it if what they fought for is coming apart in terms of our form of government? Oof. Uh, if you go out to the Veterans History Project on the Library of Congress, you will see about three and a half dozen interviews that I conducted, up to and including veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan. And if you listen carefully to they, what they say, it raises some fundamental questions about what is happening to us and whether or not all those sacrifices were worth it. Here's what I keep hearing. I have nothing to hide, so I have nothing to fear, or some version of that. I don't care if they're collecting data. I've done nothing wrong. 
You know who actually said the nothing to hide? If you have nothing to hide, nothing to fear. Reminds me again of the man in the high castle. Those words are directly attributed, look it up, to Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi minister of propaganda. See, privacy is actually everything. And it's the fundamental job and responsibility of crypto and encryption and all the other forms of security, even in the cyber world, to protect that privacy, but there's this myth, there's this meme now that if you're engaging in anything that's private of any kind, it's assumed that it's suspicious. And you have to demonstrate your innocence. But that's who's going to prove who's going to actually judge that. We get to do that. But we're not going to tell you how, because we're the government. Ooh. So here's my privacy exercise. And I want to hear some responses because I believe this is fundamental. And every time I've run this exercise, and I've got a fairly large audience here, I've done this with thousands of people now over the last several years, very small audiences, high school students, up to one was a couple of thousand in a civic auditorium in Lincoln, Nebraska. Lincoln, Nebraska. If you have nothing to hide, or you say you have nothing to fear because you say you have nothing to hide, then why don't you just give me the keys to your car and give me the keys to your apartments and your houses and give me the passwords to every account. Give me all your financial records. Give me all your health records. And I'm going to put them into a lockbox for safekeeping. And only I have the special key that will unlock the lockbox. Will you do it? Will you do it? You said, hell no. And all in this exercise I've run over the last several years, no one except someone who's being cute and said, maybe. No one has ever said to me, yes. So why is it you won't turn over if you say you have nothing to hide? Because it's a fundamental contradiction to claim that you have no responsibility as a sovereign human being with moral agency that you have nothing to hide and yet you're not willing to turn over those things that actually define who you are in terms of your own privacy. Why is that? I'm leaving you with this fundamental question before I tell you why I continue to come to places like this and speak. Because I have people questioning, why do I do all this? Why is that? Why? You're right at the heart of the American experience, the heart of what it means to be a human being. Because you can't be who you are. Then guess what? That's the center here. And it's why I've dedicated the rest of my life to defending life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. How dare anybody take those inalienable rights away from us? And as long as I continue to breathe, as long as I continue walking this earth, I will defend with every urgency I have and every fiber of my being to defend those inalienable rights. Not just for myself, but for everybody else as well. Thank you for listening.
Yeah, we are. We're running a little bit behind, but we're just going to uh, push the clock back by 15 minutes. So we, you know, we'll have a little bit of shorter lunch, but we should be okay there. Uh, we want to grant some time for everyone to at least ask a few questions. Uh, Mr. Drake will be here all day today if you want to talk with him in private or um, in a smaller group setting. So feel free. The floor is open. Yes. Snowden is an extraordinary individual. He, you know, it's interesting because the ironies of history are not lost on me when I walked across Red Square in October of 2013. We went there to award him something I have been awarded with my attorney, um, uh, a special award for, um, it was the, uh, the Adams Award in, for uh, integrity and intelligence. Sam Adams. Sam Adams, Vietnam era. Um, questioning Westmoreland's numbers. <laughs> um, the ironies were not lost on me. In fact, Lenin's tomb is being rehabilitated. Remember, I had served in the Cold War. Um, it's ironic because a lot of people have questioned why he's in Russia. He's in Russia because it was the only country in the end that would grant him asylum. Um, I've met Glenn Greenwald, an extraordinarily independent journalist. Um, some call him an activist journalist, uh, gets under the, the nose of a lot of people, um, but he speaks a lot of powerful truths. I don't always agree with him, but he speaks very directly and very distinctly about what really matters. Um, the part of the problem here is the mainstream media is largely the lapdog of the government. They serve as stenographers. Uh, power, pow I have to tell you, because I've served in the halls of power, power is an extraordinary corrupting influence, and people want access. And so if you're granted access, I mean, I, was, I remember at a conference I was actually told where, well, hey, we're going to let you in on some secrets, but then we'll get tell you which ones we want you to share with the public. Um, that's propaganda. That's not the First Amendment that I took an oath to support and defend. The First Amendment is supposed to be an a, a adversarial relationship, the press, an adversarial relationship with power. That's what it was designed for. Snowden finds himself in Russia. I don't believe that he'll be able to come back to the United States anytime soon, although he's continued to say he wants to return. Um, people question, have questioned uh, his motives. Uh, some question, you know, some of the other things that were released. But here's what he saw for me and others. That what happened to me and others, we didn't bring out documentation to prove it. It was simply our own testimony. I had thousands of pages of stuff that I could have brought out, but I chose not to because I did sign certain agreements. But non-disclosure agreements are not are designed to hide using national security and secrecy to hide wrongdoing or inefficiencies or, or violations of law. But they realized that in order to demonstrate how far the mass surveillance system had metastasized, he would have to bring out real documentation. I had revealed to the 9-11 and congressional investigators that AT&T and the Verizons of the world were turning over their phone numbers to NSA. I already knew that. I didn't have the documentation. I knew that from the accesses that I had and people that spoke to me within the system. He brought out the actual later, because remember, it was raw executive authority. There were no pieces of paper. He brought out disclose the actual order, the secret order that just had Verizon turning over 100, roughly 110 million phone numbers each and every day to NSA to put into their corporate database. For what? Hey, it's national security, right? So anything goes. Next question. Yes. Depends on the audience or depends on the person. There are some, given my technical background, I used to do a lot of, back in the go-go 90s, did a tremendous amount of consulting out in Silicon Valley. You know, it's funny because I remember in 1983, 8283, my first computer was an Atari 8-bit. I remember plugging in that 300 baud modem and hearing that special sound where it would connect to a bulletin board. Or at the time when I was a virtual member of the Chaos Computer Club in Germany. Those were sort of the halcyon days, as I call the golden era, the golden 8-bit era of computing. 
But that's where I learned to program. That's where I learned about this extraordinary technology. No one really thought about security then, right? Yeah, there was the you know War Games movie, but sort of a shadow, a premonition of what was to come. But um, there are times, depending who I communicate with, you know, I use Tails because I have to. Um, I use OTR. Um, you know, my computers are pretty locked down. I remember the government actually coming to me, uh, and I was willing to give it to them because it said, like, okay, fine. So they were unable to break uh, the passwords that I had on my computer, so they actually asked me for the password so they could see what was on them. Remember, I ended up, okay, fine, you know, you're, you're going to have access to what you claim you think I have. But they came to me because their unit, their unit down in, um, in Virginia was unable to do anything about it. Um, I do remember it's a funny moment. This is 2007, so the original iPhone had just come out. And it turned out the FBI technicians that were also part of the raid team said, oh, wow, I haven't seen one of those yet. And they came back to me later. Hey, you got that special cable for charging? Yeah, it was, that, was a, that, was a, that was a moment. There was another moment where I had a highly modified, I used to do all kinds of hardware hacking and whatnot, software and hardware. And they came up the stairs from, from my basement with this highly modified Atari 8-bit. And I said, do you really need to take that? Of course, I had Amiga down there and Atari Jaguar and all a bunch of other old stuff. A whole bunch of a different Ataris, because Atari was my favorite computer. Um, although there was Commodores and other things. But he comes up the stairs and he look and I said, You really need that? You know, it's a ten key operating system, it hasn't been updated, you know, since the early eighties. You really think and he looked he actually stopped at the top of the stairs, he looked down, and he said, Nah, we don't need this. And put it back on the shelf. Yeah. Pretty much cart everything else away, but so I I do a lot. I don't talk about it, but there are obviously people, activists, lawyers who represent um, people um, uh, who I I share my expertise. Okay, uh, because there's there's obviously there's too many forces out there that want to know, and just because you have attorney-client privilege doesn't mean that well we'll just communicate in the open because they're supposed to honor that as we found, it's been violated time after time after time. So, Tails probably represents uh, the most secure environment that I, that I will communicate with when necessary, but it's not always necessary. I do uh, PGP, although there's fundamental issues with PGP at the usability level. One of my challenges, by the way, to all of you, is really critical. If, you're, if, Bruce, if this all this matters, if privacy matters, if rights matter, then you know, we need a new a digital declaration of independence. We really do. And we have to protect those rights, even the digital rights. But thanks for asking. It gave me an opportunity to share a little bit more technically in terms of sort of the everyday of communications. Next question? Back here? Oh, so, oh. Okay.